So growing up, I used to love stories about a chosen one fulfilling a prophecy. Those used to be some of my favorites. They captured my imagination probably more than anything else. Uh, almost forgotten tales long ago about somebody that can save the present circumstances, that there's normally some evil person in power or coming into power that the chosen one can bring to an end, right? Uh, when I was really young, about fifth grade, I want to say, Star Wars The Phantom Menace came into theaters. And I wondered at the time, how could you improve upon the trilogy that was Star Wars? And there is debate that Star Wars The Phantom Menace failed to deliver on that promise. However, at the time, it was uh, new and exciting for me. Jar Jar Banks didn't annoy me. But in Star Wars, we learn of a chosen one who is meant to bring balance to the Force. He's supposed to destroy the Sith, right? Not join them. And we spend the, mo we spend the entire movie learning about this young, scrappy pod racer from Tatooine, uh, a single son to a mother. He's a little slave boy with enough riz to take a queen. Uh, oh, he had lots of riz. Ex until the second movie. The second movie, he lost it all. He starts talking about sand, how it's coarse and it gets everywhere. Not a good pickup line, fellas. Don't lead with that. You got to lull them into the relationship before you drop how much you hate sand. But in story after story, we hear about people in the past predicting about this future savior. And in tonight's passage, Peter is going to point to the fact that all of those stories have their root in truth because all along throughout the Old Testament, God was setting the seeds of the story that leads to Christ. So if you have your Bibles, open up to 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to be in technically three verses tonight, 10 through 12. So when you get there, give me a huh. 1 Peter chapter 1, 10 through 12. Huh. All right, I'm going to read it. Oh, my bad. I'm going to read it. And then we are going to pray and jump into the passage. It says this. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Father, tonight as we come before you, I pray that as we open up your word, we wouldn't do so in a way that just uh, we learn about facts about you, Father, but that we would encounter you, that we would encounter your heart uh, throughout history, throughout time, and uh, throughout eternity, Father. Uh, as we encounter you through your word this evening and through praise and worship, I pray that these students would be encouraged in their faith uh, and that they would be led by the Spirit as they go about their weeks. Be with my words this evening, Father, and help us to see you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So what is God saying through Peter here? This is kind of a weird kind of offshoot that Peter is taking, right? Last week we talked about the salvation that we have in Christ, that it's secure for us because God is the one that's guarding it for us, right? He chose us to be born again, not that we chose to be born again. Yes, we talked about that last week, some of you. Remember, some of you, you've thought about other things. I understand, I've slept since then. But now he's taking this kind of side trail to talk about this salvation that we have in Christ. That he's saying it's more important than just now. It's been this plan throughout all of eternity. Peter is saying that the whole Old Testament points to Jesus and that the prophets who prophesied were making predictions about him. Uh, and we've got a lot to go through tonight. So uh, my first point tonight that I want you to see 
is uh, going to pop up here in just a moment. My first point tonight is this. Jesus wasn't God's plan B. Another way of saying that was Jesus was always God's plan A. All right? Jesus was always God's plan A. Paul says in Ephesians 3, 9 through 11, uh, he says this, and to bring light for everyone, what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God? So what is this plan that God has been hiding for ages? This God who created all things so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. That is, the church of Christ, us here, are revealing the mysteries of God, not just to ourselves, but to the rulers of the area around us. He says, this was according to the eternal purposes that he realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. That Jesus was not plan B. That God didn't come in with the sacrificial system and say that's plan A. That when you sin, every time you do, you have to bring a goat to a certain temple in Israel and you have to put your left hand on the head of the goat and then you have to take the knife in your right hand and slit the throat of the goat and let the blood trickle out every time you sin so that you can be appeased with God. He's saying that was never plan A. And tonight... I'm going to go through uh, some of the prophecies pointing to Jesus. This fact goes so deep that it actually gets its origins in the garden. God told the world that Jesus was his plan, even in the garden. And my second point tonight, we're going to spend a whole lot of time in my second point, and then we'll spend a little bit of time in the third and final point. My second point is that Jesus fulfills all God's prophecy. All of the Old Testament points to Jesus and our need for a Savior. Any Old Testament person that you think is a hero of the faith is just a glimmer of the future Christ. Scholars believe that Jesus fulfilled over 300 Old Testament prophecies concerning the Messiah. And strap in because we're going to go through a few tonight. The first time we hear of someone coming who will fight against the serpent that caused us to sin is in Genesis 3.15. If you want to write this down, those of you who are taking notes. Genesis 3.15. We know John 3.15. Uh, 3, John 3.15? John 3.16. Jo we know John 3.16. We need to know Genesis 3.15. He says this to the serpent, I will put enmity... Between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. What's he saying? He's saying to the serpent that caused uh, Adam and Eve to sin, that there is going to come someone who will fight you. You're going to think that you're dealing a blow to him, but really all you're going to do is bruise his heel, but he's going to crush your head. And we know in Revelation, at the end of the Bible, that the serpent that caused Adam and Eve to sin was actually Satan himself, yes? This is called the Proto-Evangelium, if you like really long words. Uh, God is telling Adam and Eve that there is going to be somebody that's going to come and do a death blow to evil and death. See, Adam and Eve had sinned, and God does deal with their sin, but he doesn't leave them in that state. He tells them of someone who is coming who will defeat the serpent that tempted humanity. And we see that fulfilled in Jesus. And not only will this person come, but it will be a miraculous birth because it is from the seed of a woman. If you continue reading what God tells Eve, he says to Eve, it will be of your seed. Now, I'm not going to get in a biology lesson here, but for those of you who don't know, women don't have seed. So, what does that mean? It means that this child that will be born to a woman has to come from a virgin birth. That's why the miracle of Christmas is so important. It's not just that it was a miracle she was a virgin. It was a miracle that was predicted from Genesis 3. And we get that from Paul in the New Testament. All right? And we see that fulfilled in Matthew 1, 23 and 25 and Luke 1, 34 and Galatians 4, 4. And at the cross, 
Jesus' heel is bruised in that, th in that Satan thought he was delivering a death blow, but that only proved that Jesus was the Son of God because he rose again from the dead. It wasn't a death blow to Jesus. It was the bruising of a heel. As the Old Testament continues, God starts to narrow down and funnel where this Messiah is going to come from. That's the whole point of the Old Testament, that it's a narrowing down of who this person is that will come seed of the woman to save humanity. And so we start to see that narrowing down through the lineage of Adam. That's why in the very next passages, you get this list of names of God revealing himself to people. And you see people either identifying with Satan or identifying with God. And you see more often than not people identifying with, Nathan, with, with Satan. So God reveals himself to Noah, who only saved eight people. And then we have a better Noah through Jesus, who saves all of those who turn to him from God's ultimate wrath. Then God reveals himself to Abram and tells him that it's through his descendants that the earth will be blessed. In Genesis 12, 3, he says, I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That's not just, hey, if I bless Israel, I'm going to get good things. That's through you, Abraham, the Messiah will come through your lineage. That I am choosing you. And you see, Abraham's life, a continual mess up. That God says, Abraham, it's going to be between you and Sarah. And then it's not happening. So Sarah does what? She says, take my maidservant. Maybe it's through her that God indicated. And Abraham said, no, Sarah, that's a bad idea. No, because Abraham was an idiot. And we all would have done the same thing. But it had to be through Sarah. And then you get the miraculous birth through Isaac. Moving forward, the people of Israel are enslaved in Egypt, and God raises up Moses to deliver his people like he raises up Jesus who comes out of Egypt. Yes, it's just all pointing forward to Christ. Moses thought that he was going to deliver his people from slavery. Jesus is the better Moses who delivers us from the slavery of sin and death. Before the nation entered the promised land, Moses prophesied that God would rise, raise up another prophet like him in Deuteronomy 18, 15 through 22. Write this down, those of you taking notes. I'm not going to read all of it because it's a lot. It says, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from among your brothers. It is to him you shall listen, just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, let me hear not again the voice of the Lord my God or see his great fire anymore, lest I die. Guys, when you encounter God, it's not a, whole, a, a moment of, oh, it's me and buddy Jesus. When anybody ever encounters God, it's a, I'm going to fall flat on my face because I'm standing before something holy. This is something different. This is something other. And this something other is inviting us into a relationship with him. And the people said, Moses, we need you to intercede for us because we can't hear the voice of the living God. And Moses says, there will be somebody who comes up to intercede for you, like I've been interceding for you. And we see that fulfilled in who? Sunday school answers here. Thank you. He goes on to say, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to, the, to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. Basically saying, if you don't listen to Jesus, God's going to deal with you. Moving forward, Joshua leads the people into the promised land. If you don't know, Joshua is the Hebrew word Yeshua, and Jesus' Hebrew name is what? Yeshua. It's the same name. Joshua is a type pointing to Christ who leads us into the perfect promised land. That God is the one fighting our battles for us like he fought for the Israelites back all the way in Exodus. All of it is pointing to Christ. And then the judges come, and they seem like they're going to be the ones predicted in Genesis 3. From each tribe, a judge rises up to save the nation of Israel. But what do all the judges do? They fail. Every one of them. 
The people rebel. They turn against the Lord. The judges, everyone, I don't know why, everyone loves Gideon. Gideon was a freaking moron. First off, he procrastinated after God told him to do something, and then after he actually did what God told him to do. We cut this off in Sunday school because it doesn't tie the story up in a nice little bow. He built a statue of himself for the city to worship. And Gideon is still listed in the Hall of Faith in Hebrews. We need a better Gideon. We need a better Samson. We need Jesus. And the Old Testament is pointing to that time and time again. The nation moves forward and asks for a king. And God tells them no because he's supposed to be their king. But they insist and we get Saul. And Saul, Saul was very tall. Saul was supposed to be a good king. Was he? No. Who else in the Old Testament was a tall figure that was standing against the Israelites? Goliath, yes. Saul, Saul is very tall. Who's supposed to fight Goliath? Saul is. Saul's supposed to stand in for his people, like Jesus stands in for us. He's supposed to be the king. And he fails in his duties. And David stands up. And he fights. And David wins. But even David was a man after God's own heart, but failed time and time again. Murdered one of his best friends to have an affair. One of his sons did something horrible to one of his daughters. He did nothing about it. Another one of his sons murders that son, rebels against him, tries to take his kingdom, and he does almost nothing. At a point, David wants to build the temple of God, but God says no. Why does God say no? Yep, it wasn't just that David became a man of war, he liked killing just a little too much. But in the narrowing down of where this Messiah is going to come from, God tells David that it will come from his line. In 2 Samuel 7, 12 through 13, God says this, When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. He wasn't talking about Solomon. He was talking about Jesus. The kings all failed, proving it wasn't them. And then we get the prophets, like Isaiah, where we get the most detail about this, point, uh, this coming Messiah. Uh, you hear this generally around Christmas time. Isaiah 9, 6 through 7 says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness. From this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Is this something man-made? Is this something that people developed clever myths about and then shoehorned Jesus in to say that he fulfilled all of these 300 prophecies? Peter's going to continue in 2 Peter to say that we don't follow cleverly conceived myths about this Christ. This Christ fulfills Old Testament prophecy of God revealing himself to humanity, that it's been plan A since the foundation of the earth. This Jesus is the one that the Old Testament people looked forward to and we look back to. Isaiah goes on to say in 40 verse 3 that someone is going to have to come before Jesus he says very specifically, a voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert highway for our God. And that was John the Baptist. And if John the Baptist didn't come and Jesus came saying, hey, I'm the Lord, the Messiah, could it be true that Jesus was the Lord, the Messiah? No. We needed John the Baptist because we needed a voice to prepare the way for him. In Isaiah 52 through 50, uh, 52, 13 through 53, 12, we get this idea of what the Messiah is going to look like. Throughout the entire Old Testament, people thought the Messiah was going to be this political figure that just comes in on a white horse and he's going to wreck shop to everyone who doesn't believe in him. And he's going to bring this peace. And when we get this Savior, what do we get? We get a humble carpenter who comes into Israel on a donkey 
who's crucified on a cross, the most humiliating way to die, dying among criminals. And Isaiah prophesied that too in Isaiah 52, 12, uh, 52, 13 through 53, 12. He says, Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance, predicting the flogging that Jesus was going to go through, that he was going to be whipped with a cat of nine tails, and his flesh was going to be torn from his bones to where he didn't even look like a human being anymore. And his form beyond that of the children of mankind, so shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told to them they see, and that which they have not heard they understand. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. Basically, Jesus wasn't this dude coming in that was like, oh yeah, that's a guy I'm going to follow. Jesus came in humble. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Basically, we thought he was cursed. Deuteronomy 28 says, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Jesus became the curse for us by dying on a cross and hanging on that tree. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like sheep that before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. Do you think Jesus could have actually called angels? to save him from the crucifixion like he told Pilate? He could have. But to fulfill what the word said, he didn't. The passage goes on. I invite you to read it yourself. I could go on. There are more things that point to Christ in the Old Testament. As you read the Old Testament, look for Jesus because it's really not hard to find him. Going back to 1 Peter it says, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully. Guys, they were wondering. They were saying, God, things around us look bleak. This evil that's been brought into the world because of our sin looks bad. You say that there's going to be a coming Messiah. Where is he going to come from? Who's he going to be? inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. These Old Testament prophets were told that it was you they were serving when God revealed things to them. It wasn't for themselves. It was for you. Tonight. Whenever you open the Word of God, whenever it's preached to you, see, my job right now is a continuation of their preaching the good news to you by the Holy Spirit. And you are now aware of things that even angels long to understand. Jesus puts it this way in Matthew 24 concerning his second coming in which he will wreck shop. He says, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. Angels look down on us and they go, God, you chose him? You chose her? Why? We've seen them. We know what their life's like. Why chose them? You're going to be in a relationship with them and cause your spirit to dwell in, in him or her? Why? They aren't that impressive. And God says, this was my plan from the beginning. Angels don't get to repent from the rebellion that they did. 
God allows us to repent of the sin that we commit and have a right relationship with him that even angels don't get to have. Angels sit in heaven and go, Jesus, when are you going to establish your kingdom on earth? When are you going to make a new heaven and a new earth? He says, you don't need to know. Paul puts it this way in Romans, that the earth actually groans with the birth pangs of him coming again. That earth itself longs for the coming of Jesus Christ. And we should too. My final point tonight is that Jesus is the good news. The good news isn't just that Jesus defeated sin and death. And if you walk away with nothing else tonight, I want you to walk away with this. Your salvation is bigger than just your salvation. Don't get me wrong, you're a part of it. But this has been God's plan from before eternity began to, bef to after eternity ends. This has been the plan from the ages. This salvation that Peter is talking about, that the Old Testament prophets long to know about, this Jesus Christ, the fact that the Holy Spirit dwells inside of you if you're a believer in Christ, is a miracle. People long to know about this. It's bigger than just us. The good news is that Jesus is seated on his throne and he is king forever. No matter what you're going through, it's for your good and your king's glory. The good news is no matter how bad things may seem, Jesus will make all things right. He's the chosen one, the one who will come and finally defeat sin and death. And one day when all the evil is fully defeated, he will personally wipe away every tear from our eyes and reign forever. Do you guys believe that? Every tear you've ever cried because the death of a family member the pain of losing somebody, a friend that's betrayed you, every tear you've cried because you didn't get the thing that you wanted. Jesus not only understands that pain, he's personally going to wipe away every tear that was shed because of it. Revelation 21, 4 through 5 says, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. The band's going to come up. We're going to close in one more song. And as they do, I just want to ask you, do you have a big enough view of what your salvation actually is? It's more than just hell insurance. It's more than just comfort because your kitty got the sniffles. Those are important things. But they're not the most important thing. The most important thing that people need to know is that Jesus is seated on the throne. He is king forever. And he's going to make all things new. Let's praise the Lord who fulfills the promises because if he fulfills the prophecies of the past, he'll fulfill the prophecies of the future. You've been listening to Crosspoint Youth Ministry. For more information or to see how you can get involved, please visit crosspointbible.org. Thank you and God bless.